we have come in almost 2,000 years from the days of the Roman Empire and where crucifixion was considered a, a terrible thing to undergo, not only because of the pain and anguish, but because of the shame that was placed upon it because of those it was reserved for. And you think about the song we just sung, how strange that would be to the pagan ear and to the mind of the Romans to hear people singing that particular song. But you see things have changed so much. Nowadays we see people with a cross around their neck and so forth. I heard one fellow say one time, said if we really understood how the cross was, to the people of first century, it would be like wearing an electric chair around your neck or a noose or something like that. For that's what it stood for in the first century and for some years thereafter. And to the pagan mind, it was not something you gloried in. And that's the reason, one reason Paul said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God and the salvation. Because uh, it's in the cross. Be my glory ever. And yet they couldn't understand and unless they grasped the true and full message of the gospel. Uh, that was such a strange thing to those people to hear of what had become commonplace to us. This morning we talked about really what is said in Romans 12 and verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. The American standard said, and be not fashioned according to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You'll notice there that he says, our minds are to be transformed. Well, what does that mean? Well, I know it has more to do than just the greater matter we know as a brain because of what we've studied lately about the spirit itself, the inward man, and when the rich man finds himself in torment, Abraham tells him, son, remember. So our minds continue to go with us long after our brains and the rest of our body had gone back into the dust, that we can actually remember the various things that have done here. When you think about <clears throat> the judgment day in which we give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad, that means you'll have to, you'll have to remember what you did. Well, I don't know all that's involved there because... I can't grasp what it is to be outside of a fleshly body and even conversing in a spirit state in a place that is not material, not physical, not governed by time and space, and yet that's what it will be like. And even after heaven is a reality, we've been resurrected in glorified bodies that's fitted for heaven as these bodies are fitted for here. Uh, what will that be like? Because it won't be anything like we know of. Today, it'll be in a glorified body, even as the body our Lord now has, in a place and time and space that's amazing. But I know this I know that we will still be who we are. Same person, we continue on. Your center of consciousness, your center of being, and all that that means will still exist. So when we talk about not be fashioned or made according to this world, then we're talking about changing something other than the physical body. We're talking about letting the inward man bring the outward man into subjection to Jesus Christ. I read in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. He goes ahead to say, 
in verse 24, put away from thee a froward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Obviously then, as you look at the heart, keep thy heart. I have a responsibility to keep my mind where it ought to be. Thus we have statements in the New Testament to the effect of set your affections on things above. We know also when we see the seed sown, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11, that verse 15 of that parable tells us that when the word is sown in a good and honest heart, it's the one that brings forth fruit because it keeps the truth it's been taught. So I wanted to spend a little time since we talked about things this morning that pertain to not being worldly. And we start off that way this afternoon. And he said, uh, don't be uh, your minds fashioned according to this world. Well, we're talking about the heart. That's what he means over here in Proverbs 4 and verse 23. Keep thy heart. He could just as well have said, keep thy mind. Then he talks about what we do with our outward body. Because another place says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Which simply means that it's, we, we live in our fleshly bodies as our minds are governed and directed and follow a pattern. So I wanted to spend a little time this afternoon just on thinking about the heart. Now you'll find the word heart used a lot more in the Old Testament than you do in the New Testament. But it is used in the New Testament. Think of Romans 6, 17, and 18 as Paul reminds the Romans of what they did in becoming Christians. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin. So I want us to look at this for a moment because as we know, people tend to think of this blood pump as the heart. Oh, that's a physical muscle. But it's not the heart. I've seen people, and we've probably all done it, say, well, from the heart. <laughs> well, we we'll probably ought to be doing this when we do that. But whatever we do is going to come from our inward man as it's been taught. So I have a responsibility to govern that, and that comes from the heart too. So the heart thinks in Matthew 9, 4, and Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore, think ye evil in your hearts. So the heart thinks. In this case, they were thinking evil. The Lord read their minds and knew what they were doing. But if it thinks, then, of course, understanding must be there. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 32 and verse 4 said, The heart also of the rash shall understand knowledge. So what are we beginning to understand? Well, as we look at the New Testament, we see the inward man, or we see the spirit of man, and realize there's a correspondence there. Same thing. The heart is the inward man, is the spirit. In Proverbs 14.10 the heart knoweth his own bitterness. Now notice in those three verses, Matthew 9, 4, Isaiah 32, 4, and Proverbs 14, 10, you have the heart thinking, you have the heart understanding, and you have the heart knowing. It's kind of amazing then that people who want to claim to believe in God and the Bible is the word of God would say that you can't know anything when we find here in Proverbs, the heart knoweth his own bitterness. In Romans chapter 10, verse 10, in the, we quote this in the plan of salvation. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. But we know also faith comes by hearing the word of God. So in the process of becoming a Christian, belief is essential. Not just belief in Christ, but belief in God. 
If you just look at Hebrews 11 and verse 1 and verse 6, verse 6 lets us know that but without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that is a rewarder of them that diligently seek after him. Jesus said of himself to the Jews, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. So with the heart man believeth. Those things are essential. Those things are necessary. Not the only thing that's necessary, but it's necessary. But we also see that is with um, in the heart that man is actually brought to doubt certain things. Mark eleven twenty three. It is said, and shall doubt in his heart. Have you ever doubted anything? Well, when you did, uh, it was going on in the same place where you were believing something, where you were understanding something, where you were thinking something. How does a person come to doubt if they don't think? In 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, Paul is talking about the giving of our means as we've been prospered. And he said, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. So that's where I determine, I purpose, I plan. I say, this is what I'm going to do. Other things are said about how we determine our contribution. But nevertheless, the purposing starts there. So what have we seen thus far? The heart thinks, the heart understands, the heart knows, the heart believes. You can even doubt in your heart. And you purpose in your heart. Then if you go back to the book of Proverbs, which has much to say about the heart, in chapter 16 and verse 9, a man's heart deviseth his way. That's where the planning and purposing goes, and that's the outcome of it. I devise things. You ever sit down and devise something, planned out something, laid it out, thought of it? Uh, made a plan, well, that's what happens. It all comes from the heart. And so that lets us know why it is said that, uh, I, that, that uh, through the heart one does what he does. Mark 2, 6, but there were certain of the scribes sitting there, and notice, and reasoning in their hearts. Well, we've already seen from Matthew 9, 4 that we think with our hearts and thus we reason with our hearts when Abraham in the spirit in the Hadean world Abraham in the place of paradise spoke across that great gulf that separated paradise from punishment or Tartarus is that place of punishment is called in the place of departed spirits the Hadean world when he said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetimes hast thou good things, Lazarus evil things. Now he uh, is comforted and thou art tormented. Do you see what he's doing? He's saying, Now think. And in your thinking, reason. And as you reason it, you'll know you lived evil and he suffered evil. And now you're suffering for evil. It's really what he's saying. It's logical that you are where you are. You used the place to prove to God that you loved him or you didn't, and you proved to him you didn't. And now you're in the place that you assigned yourself. In Romans 10 and verse 1, notice what Paul says, for his concern and love for his own brethren according to the flesh. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Notice all the things that it said takes place in the heart. And I'll be going back over these just to keep us in mind. The heart thinks. The heart understands. It knows. It believes. It doubts. It purposes. It devises things. It reasons. And you can see it desires. And we pray without heart. Again, you see how much closer, closer that is or how closely they are when we speak of the inward man or the spirit of man and the heart of man. 
Romans uh, 2 and verse 4, Paul writing to the church at Rome said this about the heart. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart. Well, what does that say about my responsibility in my heart? Well, I can do things to hearten it. Remember how it is said of Pharaoh that his heart was hardened. Well, understand, I think, a little bit about how the heart is hardened in looking at the case of Pharaoh. You see, every one of the plagues that was brought on Egypt by Moses, number one, was a miracle and was to prove that what Moses is saying to Pharaoh is from the true and living God. Now, Pharaoh could see all those things. He knew that these were miracles, but he rejected the truth. And every time he did, he hardened his heart. He made it far more difficult to understand what he ought to do. That tells us how dangerous we are to ourselves. When I know it's what God says I must be doing, but I figure out some way to justify myself in not doing it. Now think of what we studied this morning and what Paul said in Romans 12 too, that we're not to be fashioned according to this world. That I have the responsibility to keep my heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life and that means I can't allow myself to do those things. And thus Pharaoh allowed himself to make the word of God an none effect on him because he rejected it. You have the same thing in 1 Timothy chapter 4. We referred to it this morning concerning the seared conscience. That's a part of the heart, the inward man. When you know what's right and when you continue to resist it and reject what you know is the Word of God, and if somebody were to say something to you about, well, you know, that's what the Bible teaches, you wouldn't even disagree with them, but you don't do it. You just harden your heart a little more. Preachers over the years have shown how that can happen. If you take boiling water and put a frog in it, he's going to hop out. He may be t severely damaged, but he's coming out of it. But if you put him in some lukewarm or cold water and ever so gradually turn the heat up, he'll sit right there and boil to death because it's a gradual thing. And that's the way Satan gets most of us, if not all of us. Rarely do we stand here a stalwart, faithful, loving soldier of the cross, and the next day uh, we're running with the devil. It happens gradually. We let a little thing in here, a little thing in there. This becomes more important. Uh, it's not so bad that I do this or don't do that. And, of course, that builds up a callous. Now, I think probably all of us have had some callous get on our hand from time to time, but if you ever shaken hands with a person that works hard with their hands all day long and have for years, how hard they are. And that's what we can do to our heart, our inward man, the part that must be pricked by the Word of God. And when we get to where the Word of God can't do it, we can't be reached. That's the seriousness of this whole thing is when we resist the truth, when we reject what we know is God's will, you can reach a stage to where you sear it. That's what searing means. It's dead skin. You can prick it and you won't feel it. And that's what happens with people. In Esther 7 and verse 5, who is he and where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? Notice the presumption that's there. We presume things. In Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Now, what is he talking about? What is all my heart? Well, when I look at all these things we're talking about, I see in the heart is intellect and the rational powers. I see it's composed of my emotions and will and my conscience. Now, that's really the best way I can describe what my inward man is, my center of personality. 
That's why we're to guard it with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. In 2 Samuel 6, 16, and she despised him in her heart. Notice how all of this is coming from the heart. Always said all these verses. 1 Corinthians 12, 33, they were not of double heart. A double heart. Well, James talks about a double-minded man. He's unstable in all his ways. What does that mean? Well, he can take it or leave it. I guess is the way you could put it. He tells you one thing one day and right the opposite the next. It doesn't bother him. You see, truth ceases to be absolute and objective. It becomes pretty much whatever you want it to be. And you can agree with this one who upholds one thing, and then the next day you agree with that one who upholds right the opposite from what this one is and then contradistinction to it. Again, that's ruining our heart. I have the power over myself to keep my heart easily motivated and directed by the Word of God. Or I do things that destroy it. In Hebrews 8.10, I will put my laws in their mind. Now watch. Here the words are used together. The same verse. And write them in their hearts. I'll put them in their minds and write them in their hearts so when we guard our hearts when we hide our God's word in our hearts then we're making sure that's what is directing our lives when we evaluate things is it in the light of the truth that we evaluate it how do we ever do only what the Lord authorizes us to do in dealing with anything if it's not appealing to that final authority of the word to determine the right or wrong of it? Hebrews 10 verse 16, I will put my laws in their hearts, in their minds I will write them. In Romans 1 9, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. See, these are parallel passages. Romans 7, 25, with the mind I myself serve the law of God. And in Nehemiah 2, 2, why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then in Daniel 7, in verse 15, I, Daniel, was grieved in my heart. And I've already mentioned Romans 6, 17 in the New Testament, how we obeyed from the heart. Now think about that for a minute. We obeyed from the heart. When a person truly obeys the gospel of Christ to become a Christian, and he obeys from the heart, that means his will is involved, his intellect and rational powers are involved, his emotions are involved and his conscience involved. That's how you obey with the whole heart. Every one of those are operating like they ought to in reception to the truth of God regarding what one must believe and do in order to be saved. And that's the point of that heart because I learned from Psalm twenty-two, twenty-six 26 that the heart lives forever. Listen to it. Your heart shall live forever. You can get plainer than that. What do all these quotations from the scriptures mean? They mean the part that will not return to dust, that we ought to be more concerned about because it's, it's going to live forever, is the Spirit. So we sow to the Spirit. If we sow to the flesh, Paul says we reap corruption. He that sows to the Spirit reaps life everlasting. Well, that's the same as sowing to the heart, to the invisible in the sense that it's not material or physical. It's not uh, affected by time and space. So when we talk about don't be fashioned according to this world, we have to understand the place of the will, the part of the heart and keeping us obedient to the truth. I, I don't know any way 
that you can make yourself in the likeness of Christ and not be obedient from the heart. There's just no way that I can think of it can happen. So it's not a, it shouldn't surprise us that people run around all over the place claiming to be great believers in God and students of the Bible and believers in Christ and declaring they love him all the time teaching you, you can't do anything in order to be saved. Well, why wouldn't the devil use that? If he can get people to believe you don't have to be obedient to the Lord, what else does he have to get them to believe to cause them to be lost? He just doesn't. It's done. If he can get them to think that, well, I can think any way I want to think and it won't affect my actions, he's got you. So it's amazing when you look in the what I call the, the devil's tackle box for fishing for men at all the different lures he's got. Every one of them is aimed at the heart. Every one of them. If he can get you thinking contrary to the truth and all the ways he can do that, believe a lie and obey a lie and you're lost. If he can get you to be deceived, he's got you. So see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, for the days are evil. We sometimes, I fear greatly, uh, live as if the days aren't really that evil. But there is one who goes about roaring as a lion, Seeking whom he may devour. Do you think he ever takes a break? Do you think he ever ceases to be interested in you? Now, the people out here in the world, he's got them. I know you all have heard preachers say this all your life. I have. But it's so true. The people in the world are lost, period. There's nothing else that needs to be done with them but possibly keep them from seeing their lost condition and keep them from understanding the truth. But what about members of the church? Now, we all know the world is just full of faithful members of the church. Well, I say that tongue-in-cheek and my tongue pretty deep in my cheek <laughs> because compared in contrast to the world, there's just a very sprinkling of real Christians on this earth. Now, who do you think the devil's after? Well, you see, he's after everybody. But if you're saved, he's after you more than anybody else. He's going to leave you alone. There's not going to be a time that he's not going to be doing something to get you to sin and then justify yourself in that sin. When I say that, I'm fully aware that's true of me as well as anybody else. Anybody in this world that's a member of the church, the devil wants you. And he as a roaring lion goeth about seeking a diligent search of patient inquiry. He's sifting you. He's looking for that chink in the armor that can get in. Now, we have to keep our hearts with all diligence. If we don't, he'll find that opening somewhere or the other, and you got us. I think fishing really is a good example when it comes to reaching people with the gospel, fishers of men, but it's also a good example of how the devil reaches us because what may appeal to you to get you to sin may not appeal to me in just the same way it might to you and vice versa. So we have to know that book and we have to look at everything in the light of that book that we might be sure we're not taking the bait. But there sure are a host of people who are glad to take that bait. Sometime when you're watching a fishing show, if you ever do that, and it's showing the various uh, lures and how you catch different fish, just let it be in your heart of hearts how the devil operates. Now, we have in the church the gospel. That's the, if you want to call it that, the lure that we use. The gospel lived, defended, and preached. And we're to preach it to every creature. That's the drawing power of God. And if it won't draw people 
then there's nothing else that can. People say, well, God save me any way you want to. He's all powerful. It's not a matter of want to. It's a matter of how he said he would and where he located his power to save. Romans 1.16 said he located his power to save in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we must be mindful as children of God to not be fashioned according to this world, as we talked about this morning, but we must renew our minds with the gospel, with the truth, and studying it daily, praying, and realizing that the things that are important to us are more important than anything else when it comes to going to, going to uh, heaven. Now, I close the lesson by simply saying, do you really want to go to heaven? Are we in this for the long run? And that means into eternity, where we ought to be, and I hope we are. But if you're a child of God and you let things slip, we urge you to repent of your sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. Guard thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. If you need to come to the Lord this time, please come while we stand and sing.